So, Joel, here we are. Plants, the macro picture of plants in our world today. Well, some of the most important species on this planet. I mean, without plants, we would have absolutely no food. And I don't know how many people re realize that, that. It's the only process in the world whereby energy from the sun is actually converted into chemical uh, potential and food and growth. And we are in trouble mm. with climate change. And it's going to hit us in Africa probably worse than just about anywhere else, right? Yeah, you know, the stats and the ones I've been very alerted to is that, OK, there'll be a lot of variation in weather, but in Africa, partic particularly southern Africa, mm. um, the lack of rainfall is going to be such that by 2050, we will be almost arid um, and no conventional crop farming will be possible. So we've got to start thinking out of the box as to how to smart be smart about farming mm. for food security purposes. And there are lots of solutions. I'm sure you can think of a couple mm. right off your head. Um, well, the kinds of things that I, was, that I was worried about some years back. I was trying to help Kenyans make maize resistant to maize streak virus. It took 25 years of conventional breeding in South Africa to do that. 25 yeah. years. Yeah. Now, we have to be able to do it much, much faster than that. I think you know, using your technology, mm. that this can happen quite quickly. But the problem is it's not as fast as I think time is allowing us mm. and funding mm. is allowing us. But I mean, if, if we think of generous solutions, it, the bread baskets of the world, Canada, some of, of Russia will be quite plentiful in rain. The African situation is pretty dire simply because 95% of our agriculture is reliant on rain fed, on, yeah. on rain. And so if there's no rain, there's, there's very little electricity in Africa. So the, the fancy solutions that people can use in Europe, vertical farming, um, hydroponics, all of that is kind of going to be a challenge for us. Now, here I'm going to get into my hobby horse, <laughs> which is plants. We mm -hmm. they commonly call them resurrection plants because they appear to resurrect from the dead. I'm going to show you just one. And the only 135 species in the world that can actually do this. So this is a rare phenomenon. And this is a tiny specimen of something we call the resurrection bush. Mm -hmm. You can see it in its dry state right here. It looks pretty dead. And here it is halfway through rehydration. In a couple of hours, it'll look like that. And that is 12 hours. So in 12 hours, it goes from looking dead to looking normal. Absolutely. And the, the trick behind this plant, I mean, plants have all sorts of strategies. You think you both, you and I know it. This strategy, to be able to lose all your water, and not die is incredibly rare. It's not so rare, I think, if you think of seeds. Most of mm. our seeds are, are, are what we call desiccation tolerant. But to be desiccation tolerant in your vegetative tissue is incredibly rare. Now, it's a long shot type of research, and we're having some success. But it's having understood what these plants do to survive that extreme water loss. We are now starting to roll out crops, or we've got initial stages of rolling out crops that are actually way, way, way more resilient to drought, extended drought. But it's going to be a long time. I mean, I'm talking mm. about, we talk, started the conversation talking about traditional versus um, conve uh, now what we call biotechnological breeding mm. and the issues that go with genetic modified organisms. What do you think about this whole issue? Well, I'm looking at what the Africans have bought into, which is the propaganda from Europe, which is anti-GMO for no good reason other than that Europeans can grow enough food anyway, so it's, it's, a, it's an affordable vanity. In Africa, it isn't. It really, really isn't. I mean, Nigeria has just adopted growing um, transgenic chickpeas. You now get transgenic chickpeas grown in Nigeria for the simple reason they're one of the biggest producers in the world. It's one of the biggest parts of their stable diet, and they really, really have to use transgenics because otherwise most of their crop dies from insects and other pests. Traditional breeding for maize streak resistance in Kenya took 25 years. It took us just a couple of years in the lab to come up with an approach to a solution, literally a couple of years, using transgenic plants. So we're taking something from the virus that is causing the problem, we're putting it into plants, and then those plants are now resistant to the pathogen. There's, you can do this for all sorts of things. You can do it for herbicides, you can do it for pests like coddling moth, and the various stalk borers, they already, South Africa's maize, I think 80% of it is transgenic and resistant to uh, either 
herbicide or stalk borers. Now, Nigeria has finally jumped the GMO divide and started planting um, transgenic ch um, chickpeas. Because that's their staple diet, a very large part of it, it's also something like 80% of the crop can die in any given year from various reasons, but mainly due to pests. If you can prevent that happening, there's already well over 100 million people in Nigeria. They can then feed a whole lot more people because that's what's happening in Africa now. A billion people and the number is going up. The only way we're going to improve agriculture to increase the yields to cater for that is going to be some kind of modern biotechnology. And your drought resistance, how do you go about getting that into a crop? Well, pretty much the same process you've described in terms mm. of putting genes into a crop. Um, that's one approach. And in, in it, what are the, uh, the inevitable trade-offs of that would be some yield loss. Mm. But you do have a plant that survives extended drought. And if we get as, tr as extreme as I'm hoping to envision, where in fact you get a resurrection crop themselves, in other words, the plant can actually lose virtually all its water and come back, it would be of value only perhaps in the in first instance to subsistence farmers which, because one of the pheno, um, phenomenon with resurrection plants is once they are, they get rain, not only are they green and you can grow them, eat them, um, graze them, within 24 hours they produce seed or flowers within 48 to 96 hours after rehydration. Hmm. So it's, a, it's a, a rescue mechanism in themselves. So you can say to your subsistence farmer, well, you might not get a yield much, but you will get a crop. Hmm. Um, and so it's, a, it's a, one of the safe um, fa fail-safe mechanisms, but there have to be a lot more attention to a lot more things so that there would be ultimately final food security. Um, and I think using plants as a model uh, organism, as I have done, has got a lot of value. Um, but I think one of the things we, we often forget is that not only are they originally, or they food, f important for food security, but they have and all that always will be important for medicinal purposes. purposes. Um, and so there's a number of products that, that plants can be developed and used, used. But for example, you're thinking that solutions can come out of Africa for African problems? I am thinking that. I'm thinking that some of these resurrection plants that I work with, them themselves could become crops and themselves mm. be a form of commercial um, income. Mm. Um, producing the one I've just shown you, that particular plant is highly medicinal. Used as a tea in Africa, mm. it's used for wound healing and in Georgia Mani skincare range. <laughs> so it's becoming quite sought after and it's yeah. quite a nice little value chain into our country. But I mean, think using, I think it's the way you use, I mean, you in many ways use plants very innovatively, but your research on viral mm. antivirals is fascinating. Please just tell me a little bit about that. Look, we started with um, plant pathology. I used to be a plant pathologist, and then I went from looking at what the virus did to plants to wondering what the plant could do about viruses. We went a long way down that road, and sadly, the funding didn't carry on, and we'll get to that mm -hmm. later as well. We came up with an innovative technological fix for the worst maize disease in Africa. But that got us into plant biotechnology, and that led us into what can you make in plants that is actually going to be of some use pharmaceutically, uh, therapeutically, um, which got us into, you can make really quite expensive, quite complicated proteins, the kinds of things that are being touted as biologics now. You can make them in plants. You can make them cheaper and at larger scale than you can in many other systems, and especially cheaper. And people say, well, then that suits for Africa. No, actually, it's suited for everywhere. Mm. But the point is, we can do it here because we can do it on less money than most other people could. And if we can, then we can start becoming self-sufficient in things that otherwise there's an anti-rheumatoid um, arthritis drug you can keep yourself mobile with it in South Africa if you're willing to spend 500,000 rand a year. Wow. You can make those antibodies in plants. You can make them far, far cheaper. And in fact, there's a couple of people exploring the business model around doing that right now. So that's what we do is we partnered up um, with local people who developed a spin out from our work that is actually starting to make money already by making high value proteins in plants, it's a relative of tobacco plant, 
using the kinds of technology that we're using in the lab at the University of Cape Town to basically get a foot in the door in a local pharmaceutical market stroke biotechnology industry that we can then start making therapeutics and vaccines. That is our big thing. Wow, that is fantastic. Well, well done. And so what, what do you see in the future? If we can get an industry actually started and we've got a toehold in it right now um, so that we're making things that other people want, then we start making things that people need. And that would be local pharmaceutical industry and then wider than that because we're feeding into a worldwide need because what there's a couple of hundred million people in the world maybe who can afford the kinds of biologics mm. that I've just mentioned and things like anti-cancer drugs that are made of antibodies. If you can make those much, much cheaper, you're talking about being able to get sophisticated therapeutics into poorer populations, mm. which improves quality of life, which improves the ability of people to actually get out of poverty, amongst other things. Yeah. And you're, it's a disruptive technology because big pharma is not really compatible with this. They've got too much money invested in the kinds of things that they do and which they do very well. But they're not going to change their business model. Yeah. It's going to be left to startups, to upstarts, literally. Um, it will then get bought out by big pharma eventually, but it'll be a complete revolutionary industry. What does it feel like to be at the spearhead of all of this? Oh, we're not, sadly. <laughs> 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 because not enough money, and we'll get back to that, because that is the crisis of our kind of work in South Africa. Um, and we're not simply, we're not big enough. Mm. We contribute, we are, we're possibly the best in Africa, but, well, we are the best in Africa, what we do. We do compete um, in the world sphere in terms of academic, but not commercial. And that is what we really, really do need to develop. Mm. So Jill, um, on your side, on the other hand, you've got an African solution for an African problem that could actually also go worldwide. Your TEF example. For yeah, you know, TEF is, a, is an amazing, it's, it's termed an orphan crop, and, and those mm -hmm. crops obviously are not widely known in the rest of the world. They haven't actually been as bred mm. as, as our maize, wheat and rice are. And it's and interestingly a lot more resilient to drought and well, particularly drought stress um, than most of our conventional mm. cereals are. Now, TIF is serves I think 75% of Euro Ethi Ethi Ethiopians. 75% of the diet mm. uh, is is TIF, and I think the world might know it as um, injera bread, uh, which is made out of the seed of TIF. Now that's gluten free. So mm. suddenly everyone's thinking, wow, TIF, the superfood. Um, and in fact, it's something I think we need to grow a lot more mm. of, these orphan crops, but also to develop some more of their resilience to other abiotic stresses, such as salinity. I mean, one of the things that we're finding in our farming areas is that um, in, inappropriate farming, but in la lack of rain has caused increased salinity in the soil levels, mm. or the water supply that the farmers can use if they do have for irrigation. So TIF has a, a relative uh, the, one of the close relatives is a resurrection grass called Aerograstus nodensis. And I've used nodensis as a model to actually improve all of the type of abiotic stress um, sores that still is associated with TIF growth. So increased salinity tolerance, increased lipid in the leaves, and the of course the maintenance of gluten-free seeds, which is mm. a bit highly valuable. So I think we can be very innovative in, in our agricultural practices here in Africa, not only using Bambara, for example, I think it's known as Bambara bean, it's mm -hmm. um, related to cowpea and chickpea and things that we know are high, rich, high in protein. It's also an orphan crop which has incredible nutraceutical values and not well developed anywhere. And I think, you know, what I'm proposing in these crops is to make them more resilient. Climate smart is my mm. new word for it. Let's make them more climate smart, but actually work with crops that here in Africa we already know, we are really familiar with and we prize. Um, and as I said, highly nutritious. So we're looking forward to 2050 now. What is going to be happening by 2050 if things work out? If we have um, a lot of these res resilient crops out there, um, I think we'll be able to cope with about 20% of our food security needs. 
-hmm. So this is, as I've been saying all along, this is only one solution. We're going to have to think of things like desalinating water in order to um, grow more agriculture, spread our agriculture into areas maybe where we haven't even... I mean, mm -hmm. only 15%, 13% of, of South Africa's land is in fact irrigable mm -hmm. at this moment mm -hmm. in time. Um, and so I think the situation, unless we do have big interventions, is going to be pretty dire. And for the whole of Africa, not just South Africa. I would guess that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are areas that are slightly more mesic. Mm -hmm. um, but I think... Mesic? Mesic as in sly, naturally sly, mm -hmm. slightly higher rainfalls. Right. And in the predicted climate change models, we'll still get a fair amount of rain. So I mean, climate change predicts extreme drought down in the south uh, yeah. of, of Africa, but also extreme wet in many other areas of the world. Also a problem, flooding is a major problem. And if rains do come after an extreme drought and they come really hard, then we also have to think of that effect. But so the biggest problem around about 2050 is going to be, can we maintain agriculture? Mm. Can we maintain production? And does it get to the people though? And that, okay, that's outside of the realm of agriculture and plants, that's, that's politics. Yeah. But if we could get the politics right so that we could get this sort of thing actually kicked off and running. I think it was Zimbabwe, they have just allowed milling of transgenic maize for the first time for okay. the simple reason that um, they have to have it. Yeah. They didn't want any transgenic maize anywhere near the entire country. Now they're milling it so that people have got uh, maize meal to eat. I think we, you know, people in Africa, people in the world are going to have to realize that this is the way of the future. Mm. And I mean, in my opinion, the fear mm. around genetic modification is completely misunderstood. If one could, and that's where we as advocates have actually got to do something mm. or do more, but get ordinary people who see how valuable something is and get them to do it because mm. it's in the end it's the farmer who's got to grow it. Yeah. And in Brazil they ended up adopting uh, GM beans for the simple reason that the population was already growing them because they smuggled them into the country. They smuggled South African maize into Kenya, for example, because it was oh, naturally bred, mm. but it was the only seed that was resistant to the virus that we worked on. But it was illegal to obtain it the way they did it, but they don't care if they can grow something that is going to grow and not die mm. due to virus damage. They'll do it anyway. So if governments get with this program and actually start putting stuff in the ground that doesn't get killed to 80% by insects or 90% by viruses or 80% by fungi or a mixture of these things, then all of a sudden you have food security. And when you have food security, you've got higher income, mm. and then that starts a whole economic revolution. And if you add on top of that the kinds of biotechnology we can, we can do using plants, yes. that's going to be really, really good for Africa. The whole uh, anti-GMO anti resistance movement, do you have any idea where this all started from in Africa? I believe in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's still incredible resistance there and I'm, I'm not sure why. Because be it's honest. a vanity, that's why. <sighs> as, yeah. as you said earlier, you know, if it's adopted locally because it actually makes a difference, mm. um, that's the people who have to have perhaps be the promoters of the technology. But it, it ends up being it's all emotion mm. and there's no science in it at all mm. because if you're evidence-based you'd realize that there's absolutely no problem with any transgenic plant literally including ones that have got scorpion toxin in them because scorpion toxin doesn't kill the people who eat the plants it kills the insects that eat them. Now, little things like that yet the moment that emotive you know you've got a toxin in there Bacillus thuringiensis toxin kills lepidopterans, aka things with wings that look like moths. It doesn't do anything to people, but it's a toxin. And then all of a sudden, that's the only message that gets through. Mm. And then European lobby groups bring it to Africa and India, for yeah. example. And suddenly it becomes a highly polit political, highly emotional issue with absolutely no scientific basis whatsoever. What do you think about? CRISPR as a technology that not too many people can argue with is a genetic mm. modification. Okay, so CRISPR is the 
acronym that I can never actually remember, but it's a virus-derived bacterial resistance system mm. that derives from DNA out of viruses. And it has a mechanism that we've adopted, which is e extremely accurate at cutting out pieces of DNA or putting pieces of DNA into other organisms. And the beauty of it is that you can do it and leave no trace. There's no evidence, literally, that the plant or whatever it is that you've engineered, because you can do it apparently with humans as well, if you believe what came out of China. Um, you can do it and leave no trace, and there's no evidence. So you can't call it a, a standard GMO. So then what do you call it, and how do you regulate it? And the point of it is it makes the kinds of manipulation that you would like to do to plants much easier and takes away all of those negative scenarios like you have an antibiotic resistance gene in there because you don't. You have foreign DNA in there because you don't. Mm. Or you've, you've switched something off that you didn't want or you've turned something on that you do want but it's all part of the DNA that came with the plant in the first place. That is wonderful because that's going to be the revolution in, um, in agricultural crop engineering. I absolutely agree with you, and I think it's an avenue that I'll be approaching, utilizing quite soon, mm. where you actually, if you understand the whole suite of genes which are regulated by a particular regulator, right. to be able to regulate that whole downstream suite using CRISPR is incredibly elegant and very efficient. Well, the sorts of things that you can do as well, you can take uh, the Agrobacterium tumefaciens, which is the crown gall bacterium, which naturally genetically engineers plants. I mean, it is responsible for engineering sweet potato 9,000 years ago, probably before humans actually ever got around to looking at them. Subject. Completely natural engineering. Now, if you couple that with CRISPR, so that you're using something that automat well, automatically, naturally does genetic engineering, with something that is extremely sophisticated at it, you can achieve things much, much quicker, much cheaper, and you can do it to plants in the field, potentially. Mm. That's a snake pit because then the, the ethics of changing the genome of something that is out there in the wild starts becoming problematic. But on the other hand, it means you can do anti-pest um, anti engineering on the fly. You know that there's something coming through like an aphid swarm. You can actually yeah. spray plants with something that will make them resistant to that aphid swarm. The reason it's an emotive issue is that it raises the specter of you could change humans the same way, and you actually could. Mm. If you can do this sort of thing with a crop plant, you could potentially do it with humans or anything else. That's where, where do you draw the line then? What, what, is, what is engineerable ethically and what isn't? Mm. And that starts becoming a very, very serious issue for down the road for the future generations. Mm, absolutely. But meantime, we could start using that sort of technology now. It's just that we really do have to think about where it ends up. Yeah. In terms of making much more water deficit tolerant crops, will work well in, in mm. rural areas, subsistence farmers, where in fact rain is still going to be the key driver of agriculture. But what about the urban spread? I mean, we, we're going to have to think of other ways of food security, not just the conventional farming methods. Have you got any thoughts on that? Well, it's going to happen in Africa the same way it's starting to happen in places like the States where they're actually taking old skyscrapers and they're fitting them out as vertical, vertical gardens but also vertical farms. Mm. Um, I know of somebody in Pretoria who's set up a system using aeroponics, hydroponics and LED lights, for example, in old containers that you can stack on top of each other and just pipe water into yeah. and then put solar panels on the top of it. So these are solutions that we should be getting into and some people are already. They need to be made easier. Mm. And then that leads into the whole new food movement. Because if you want to get away from really um, carbon intensive, if you like, or crop intensive farming, which means getting away from animals, then you're going to have to start giving people what they want in terms of food, increasing urbanization, increasing sophistication equals impossible burgers, beyond burgers. And guess where the protein that that 
that they are composed of that gives it the feel and taste of meat, guess where it comes from? You tell me. Beans. Beans. Leg hemoglobin out of beans. Well. Except that they grow it in yeast. It's just a faster way of doing what plants do. Yeah. Providing a really rich uh, protein source, but the, the mouthfeel? Tastes like blood. If you want a simple answer. Okay. Yeah. But again, I mean, we're going straight away back to plants. Yeah. I mean, I think people have thought of other solutions, again, avoiding animals. Um, what about insects? Absolutely. Um, I think that's, most people do feel nauseated by the feel mm. of eating a mopani worm, but it's something that has been utilized in the past. If you eat a crayfish, you can eat a mopani worm. I would agree with you there. And apparently they taste a little bit like peanut butter. Well, they're crunchy peanut butter, but yeah. <laughs> the point is, what are you feeding them? You're feeding them with waste food generally, and most of that's going to be plant. So again, you end up in this sort of virtuous cycle where you're growing plants. You've then got food waste that is mainly composed of plants that you then feed to insects. So it's something that is going to feed urban populations to a huge extent, but animals too. Animal protein um, can be sometimes best got via insects rather than having to feed them uh, grass, hay, leaves, whatever. Indeed, and therefore ex probably el eliminate huge areas of pasture grass, fast pasture farming, mm. again water intensive, um, and enable urban spread. Yeah. But is this going to be healthy? I mean, in my opinion, if we have healthy basic food mm. coming from plants, the risk of disease should be less and therefore we won't have to rely on huge pharma to heal us um, if there's nutritious food. So I mean, the point of going back to how nutritious is this? Depending on exactly what you eat and you get this criticism of vegans all the time they don't get enough protein. Not true, there's a few hundred million people in India who could give the lie to that. Point is if you can supplement or improve food crops and you can do that by making them transgenic, by using CRISPR, whatever you like. If you can add, the, add to the protein content, add to the micronutrient content, yeah. golden rice is a very good example. I was going to say, yeah. Because now that many million kids won't go blind yep. due to vitamin A deficiency. If there's a fortified banana coming fairly soon, uh, yeah. that they're working Iron on in, in Uganda. Yeah. Yeah. And vitamins, I mean, um, not only vitamins, speaking upon antioxidants. Mm. I mean, a strong, strong thing that most plants will do in, in response to any kind of stress is to pump up their particularly polyphenol antioxidants, which go into the medicinal properties Absolutely. as well. Um, well. The thing I like about um, the fact that organically grown plants are full of antioxidants is because they're all stressed, because they've all got so many disease um, inducers of stress yes. responses that they produce polyphenols and the like. But now you touched on the various medicinal qualities of things like the resurrection plants. If one now deliberately farms that, one of the big areas one could get into is so-called secondary metabolite engineering. Yeah. If you can engineer a plant to make substances that are of huge use to the chemical, pharmaceutical, nutraceutical industries yep. from existing varieties of plants in South Africa and especially the Western Cape are really good at having varieties of plants. If you can start engineering some of that for higher, higher production, production in a nicer plant, for example, you have added value to local yep. industry, to local production, yep. local biotechnology, which is also going to be part of the sort of 2050 revolution making stuff out of plants that you don't get right now, but is already proven to be valuable because it was a folk remedy, yeah. um, traditional remedy, that yeah. sort of thing. But some of the um, medicinal plants that we have in South Africa, as you say, accumulate these very strong po uh, specific polyphenols, mm. which can be uh, um, utilized quite targetedly in a medicinal sense. I mean, Marathamnus, the resurrection mm. bush, has been is a specific extract, which has been chosen shown to treat very effectively triple negative breast cancer. Good girl. So it's, yeah, so going straight back to the plant rather than using mm. your your chemo um, mm. therapeutic roots, and I, I think really we it, it, it is going back to Mother Nature, um, and, and because she has guided us, if I may call her a she, um, in many of our inventions right around mm. the world, 
And, and with the modern science approach, as you say, chemical engineering and all sorts of things, we could probably solve a lot of our problems very efficiently. Our primary uh, goal in, in this was for people. And one does this and you realize that the development time is a minimum of 15 years, so you take a step back and you start looking at animals. Then the One Health movement actually focused our attention in a slightly different area. Because the One Health initiative has the principle that the health of the environment, which is the animals and the plants and of the people, needs to be looked at as a whole. Oh. So the health of the uh, small farmer, for example, is dependent on the health of the plants and the health of the animals. Plants, you can engineer plants and you can make them more healthy and more productive. What do you do for animals? Mm. And it turns out that vaccines are one of the best things you could do. Okay. And ways of detecting disease that are cheap enough to be used in kraal side. So you can walk into a makeshift kraal in the middle of, of KZN with a little plastic device that you can stick into the shoulder of a cow, get a drop of blood out, and see what disease they have. But in order to make that kind of thing affordable, plants would be an extremely good way of doing it because we can engineer them or we can engineer bacteria to make them oh. make the kinds of proteins that we need, first off for diagnostics of the animals that feed the farmers, and then potentially exactly the same product once you've got that established as a vaccine. Mm -hmm. So things like foot and mouth disease, a cheap diagnostic for foot and mouth disease virus, could become a cheap vaccine for foot and mouth disease virus. Because right now they grow live virus in, a, it's called BSL-4 facilities. In other words, maximum yes. bioprotection. Then they kill it. Then they use that as a vaccine. We're talking about being able to make a protein in a plant. So immediately you've lost all of that bioprotection Yep. That's not necessary anymore. All of that stainless steel is gone. And you're relying on making something in a plant that you can then purify to some extent, not even uh, completely pure, and use as a vaccine. So that is where we could go, and that would revolutionize agriculture in Africa because it would make things affordable that presently don't even get used or get used to a very small extent and then only by the richer farmer. That's fascinating, and I mean, I'm, I assume you're going bioreactors at the end. So once you've got your plant protein, you're actually not you, um, promoting or multiplying them in, in plant cell cultures? Not necessarily, although in fact, the first vaccine that was ever approved that was made in a plant was made in plant cell cultures. Okay. Now, you can do that, mm. and it's actually, there's a human therapeutic that is made in exactly that way. They use 800 litre plastic bags with carrot cells. Wow. They're even slight orange color because they're literally these things are making pigment. It's an 800 liter plastic bag full of carrot cells with liquid bubbling through. That makes a human therapeutic against a thing called Gaucher disease, which is a hereditary disease most common in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is why Israel developed it. Yeah. That was tested phase three trials in South Africa because of the lot of Lebanese and uh, Jewish people that are here that have okay. that genetic defect. So the moment two factories in the States and uh, UK, I think, both went down at the same time. They're the only places who made this protein. The only people that were making a substitute were these Israelis with their plastic bags and carrot cells. That got accelerated licensure and went into people. So the two things that were licensed first for animals and for people were both made in uh, plant cell culture, which is much, much cheaper than animal cell culture because you just need some simple sugars, mm -hmm. a couple of salts, and a big plastic bag. Okay. But if you can do it in a whole plant, and you can, it adds a couple of problems in terms of amount of processing that you might have to do, potentially adds some contaminants. But at the same time, it's a lot cheaper even than that sort of cell culture. And you can get around all of the other problems. They were making antibodies against Ebola, the so-called um, ZMAP, mm -hmm. which we would call ZMAP. Those antibodies were made in okay. tobacco cells in a place called Kentucky Bioprocessing in the US. Tobacco plants. Yeah. Could you them in plants very quick, very cheap, mm. needing water? 
mean, water is, is essential um, to this planet. Mm. And in fact, um, there's a quite a cool documentary going to come out by PBS uh, in, on Earth Day in 2020 about the power of the molecule. That is an unusual molecule in and of its own self, and that nothing on this planet can actually um, survive without mm. it. Absolutely. Yeah. So the thing about water is that you can remediate water using plants. And okay, here I'm, I mean microalgae, for example. Yeah. So if you tie the need for water to the purification of water to use of plants, mm -hmm. and you can engineer microalgae, which is something that we actually had a pilot project going with chemical engineering, is to how can you get genes into microalgae and make them do things. We've managed to an extent. We have a Ooh. patent pending on this. Whoa. That means that all of a sudden you have this closed cycle because mm -hmm. you're using plants to purify water that gets fed to plants. And it's in a setting where you can circulate these things. So you're mm -hmm. taking mm -hmm. water that's already gone through hydroponic system. Mm -hmm. Purifying you could potentially purify it by growing algae in it and then filter out the algae and use it again and use the algae for something potentially as well. Um, as some sort of feed? Yes. Well, I've also heard and uh, used, used this technique in utilizing it to grow um, triacyl glycerols, which mm. are biofuels in a sense. So in the world of fuels, mm. plants can be utilized just as well by putting just in the right oils. They, naturally, they produce yes. this, but you can actually en enhance the process in, in many um, in organisms. But I mean, it also gets back to so what they now call the unexplored universe. I mean, we know a lot about viruses and bacteria and things that cause pathogenic responses. But there's a whole lot of them out there that are actually very useful and um, work together with plants in, mm. in, a, in a sort of a unified system. I mean, I'm starting to look at things called endophytes, so mm -hmm. fungi that are associated within the plants. They don't actually ever grow outside of the plant. The whole life cycle is uh, within the plant. And now if there's a resurrection plants have a number of these endophytes that dry down with them and recover with them. So in other words, they're desiccation tolerant as well. Exactly. Now, if you look at what these things produce, it's a, they are hugely helpful. A lot of hormones, a lot of growth mm. factors and things to the plant. So it's a symbiosis system. Now, even looking at those and possibly applying those mm. to a crop um, is an, another way I'm thinking at the moment. You know, so l Let's look at the good bugs mm. and what can that do to enhance health of our, recent, of our crops that we want to feed so who else is looking at that sort of thing in our space? I mean, you're doing it because you're looking at the microbiomics. Correct. Endophyto microbiomics. I think there's quite a bit of work happening in Pretoria um, mm -hmm. on microbiomes and how they can be utilized mm -hmm. in for applied process. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, but looking at good root bacteria has become quite a popular thing these days. In other words, not just what's inside the plant, but how do legumes. We know, you know some classic model where there's a symbiosis between bacteria providing nitrogen for the plant and one foot. But there's a number of them out there that we haven't identified yet. And I mean, it's literally looking at any one of these plants. Paul Mayers does it. Mm. Looking at, at the root micro, well, soil microbiome to find TB drugs. But why not plant health? Exactly. Mm. So if you can find the ways that these things use to recognize the plants in order to become Signaling. symbiotic to make ni to fix nitrogen, for right. example. Yeah, I mean, that would be huge. So what are, one of the things I'm trying to do is volatilome signaling. So you actually test the volatiles that are spread mm. from the plant to the bacteria to actually attract it. Um, in t and what are the metabolites that this plant is excreting into the soil to attract the bacteria? Mm. Well, as I said, we went back to working on uh, animals. One, because it's potentially much, much quicker to get something into them. Second, it's easier to test. But originally, back in 2005, we started working on um, influenza virus because of the H5N1 scare coming out of Hong Kong, just like the scare has come out of China now with the coronavirus. And we could potentially do exactly what we did then, which is start to make a virus protein in plants that you could use both as a, as a diagnostic and as a vaccine. In fact, we got a patent on that that we've licensed on the flu. We licensed oh. to a Canadian company that is sitting on it and if, if and unless or until H5N1 ever becomes a problem. 
but exactly that same technology could be used as a rapid response mechanism for the coronavirus right now. And we're looking at it. And Cape Biofarms, which is a spin-out company from the work we do, has in fact already got the machinery rolling to actually try and make that protein. So this is the surface protein of the coronavirus, which is what you make antibodies to, which is what gives you immunity, but is also what you would use as a basis for tests, for rapid testing, bedside testing, mm -hmm. plain side testing, for that matter. So there's an avenue where you're much, much more agile. This is a term mm. that the IT sphere uses a lot. You have an agile solution, mm. because the cost to, of the infrastructure necessary to do this is so much less that you can do right. it profitably on a much smaller scale, yep. and then scale it, scale it up smoothly instead of in big chunks. Mm. And by big chunks, I mean $100 million chunks, which is what the amount of stainless steel necessary to even make a pilot vaccine costs you if you're doing it by conventional cell culture. Because if you're doing it by plants, all you do is increase the amount of plants you make mm. for the same size downstream processing facility, which goes the same. If you can grow lettuces in a vertical farm using LEDs and hydroponics in Japan that are cheap enough to go into a supermarket, you can grow vaccines exactly the same way. That is absolutely fascinating. And in terms of public perception of that kind of mm. vac uh, vaccine, I mean, w apparently people don't particularly want to take vaccines. Mm. How do you think that they will react to a plant-based, safer vaccine? vaccine? I th think it's, you, you'd have a much stronger case as a scientist defending such a thing, although vaccines are safe and the way they make vaccines is safe. But when you're hit with emotive statements like, they're using pig cells. Yeah. There's a Jew or a Muslim, I cannot have something that's made in pig cells. Or they're using cells from dead embryos to make this. And as a humanitarian, I cannot possibly yeah. tolerate this. You now say to them, I made that in a tobacco plant. What is your objection to that? Now, can you possibly have an objection yeah. to that? And it's the basis for the Beyond and Impossible burgers, for example, is a plant protein that looks exactly like an animal protein, which has the taste of blood, which is why you can have a hamburger dripping red, red juice and every single ingredient in it comes out of the plant. And in fact, here's where I make my distasteful joke about the cannibal burger. You could make human hemoglobin in a plant, human hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. It would, no, there's no human DNA there at all. You've made that gene synthetically, you put that thing into a plant, it's making this protein that is red. You could put it in a burger and call it um, a cannibal burger, and people would buy it just for the sheer novelty value. Mm -hmm. And of course, no humans were hurt in the making of this burger, just as now you can get chicken and pork and beef in terms of impossible food that is all plant-based. I mean, what I would like is to get people off that and back down to the more basic plant food that yep. doesn't have to look like an animal, piece of an animal, just to be, um, just to be familiar. Of course, the burning question around all of this, it of course, is funding. I mean, I, um, I think both of us probably find struggling in the university environment to get sufficient funding to actually realize our dreams. I mean, one of the projects that I really, really, really am on the edge of rolling out and really require the money for is to be able to produce these dry land grasses mm -hmm. so that can be utilized for, f for human food and animal food. And that's what I call my smart climate smart grass project. It, I, I would require around about 25 million euro as a startup. Um, and to what get, sort of time period is that for? I'm thinking five years just to get the rollout mm -hmm. into the field. And then we need to, of course, get the next tranche in. But five years, five, uh, 225 million euro, I'd mm. be a happy camper just for one project. <laughs> and I have several others that I'd love to part. But what, are, what have you been doing? I mean, have you... Look, the base cost of the kinds of things that we'd really like to do, we need a facility that can make um, so-called GMP, good manufacturing practice, clinical grade material that would cost about $10 million. So a facility that costs $10 million, and that's um, founded on speculation by people in Germany and the US who really do know what they're talking about. It will 
possibly cost slightly more here because you'd have to source things from overseas. Once you've got something like that here, you've got a facility that could make pilot batches of vaccines that would be so much cheaper than a factory that you would put up for any other way of making the vaccine, same vaccines. Mm. So for example, you, you want to make something like polio vaccine. You put up a stainless steel structure that uses um, animal cells to grow polio virus to make a vaccine with. This would cost you well over $100 million because that's what stainless steel costs and costs to run. Now you've got something that's $10 million, that's plants. The upstream costs, which is growing the plants to make the protein that is what you feed into the plant, as in the, the small bit of stainless steel that you need for the final process, that is so much cheaper that it would make the whole thing extremely feasible. It would make it for Africa. And the problem is that we don't have the money to do that here now. We can't cut that. We've been trying for years. We cannot cut that money loose from the government or the various funding agencies here. So we have been looking overseas, and there actually are prospects of making this happen. Well, that's wonderful news, in mm. fact, that there are prospects. But it's actually quite sad, in my mm. opinion, that we're not getting help um, from the very people we are trying to help. Mm. But maybe just awareness is something that needs to be made, people be made more of worldwide. Um, that the solutions that we offer in Africa can be incredibly creative and very viable. And plants. I mean, mm. plants, which in my opinion are the best, the coolest things on the earth, and have an intelligence not too different <laughs> from you and I. Which brings us to what a lot of people dispute, um, is the intelligence of plants. Mm. I mean, I, we do know that they do send electrical signals from roots to leaves to communicate with each other using neurochemicals rather like mm. you and I. And I love the, the sort of classical TED talk by Greg Garg. He's a neurophysicist, neuroscientist actually. And he worked with a, a Venus flytrap, which actually obviously, and we all love it because mm. it shows this emotive thing of snapping shut on a fly. And he put an ECG monitor, rather than you'd, like you'd put on your heart or your wrist to monitor your pulse. And interestingly, if you stimulate the hairs inside of this uh, Venus flytrap, and not just one, a flytrap can count it has to have at least four hairs stimulated by an object before it shuts snap. But when it does, you see the similar impulses that you and I would see on our nerve, mm -hmm. on our ECGs. And this can happen across plants. Um, God goes on to show the classic mimosa plant, which if on touch, drops its leaves. So you have this lovely alert little branch, drops its leaves. And what he did is he placed an electrode on the mimosa and on the flytrap stimulated the fly trap and the moment it shut itself the mimosa leaves dropped so there's communication electrical communication between mm. them nicely demonstrated in that ca that instance but what we're not aware of because we can't smell it is that as we walk out amongst plants is that they're communicating with each, each other with volatile signals um, and i think that the beautiful study there was van voter in south african man working originally then on kudu but it's been demonstrated mm. for a number mm. of of organisms where a acacia plant if it is browsed by an animal and it sends out a volatile signal ethylene mm -hmm. which goes downwind to another stand of acacia plants and instantly within 15 minutes they make a, a particular polyphenol which not only tastes foul to anything gra grazing it but actually combines with the protein in the animal's stomach making it not be able to digest the protein mm. so they actually will not eat an acacia plant downwind of one that's just nibbled on. And so it's a beautiful way that they communicate with each other to not be overgrazed. And then there's a classical study done by a South African called Van Vota on acacia trees, where he noted that if a kudu or a giraffe browsed, grazed and bit off a twig of acacia in an upwind stand, an ethylene volatile signal, signal went to the downstream wind stand of acacias, in which within 15 minutes a particular polyphenol is made, not only does it taste bad, but it binds proteins in the animal's stomach, making it not want to eat mm. that tree again. So the one acacia warns the other in order to not be overeaten. And I think it's, it's really smart. I mean, plants, plants, I think we should study them for future appli mm. applications. Um, they were, they've been around a hell of a lot longer than us, and I think they're much smarter than you and I. But there's a thing about season sensing. Yep. You know we have plant growth rooms 
They've got they're exactly the same yeah. temperature, humidity, lighting all year round. Our plants know when it's winter and they know when it's summer. And we get a lot more out of them in summer than we do in winter. All other conditions being identical. Yeah. It's literally the time of year. So I think you're right. If we learn to harness some of this, because we don't right now. Mm. We're just brute primitive, take it, exploit it, mm. do something. If you can start harnessing the way they communicate with each other and with bacteria, with fungi, mm -hmm. and using light for that matter, um, it's going to be, do a lot of good for us. Let's hope.